Yeah, I'm just waiting for more speakers. Hi, Francis. Can I actually start doing the first set So welcome everyone, um, this is Technology Session 5, I'm Tom, the session host. Um, the, the session is Technology Internals, we've got three talks, first on Parsoid, uh, dealing with Wikitech so you don't have to. Second talk is on finding and fixing software bugs for the Wikipedias, and the third is Ask the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, sorry, you've got this here. I should have this too. Ask the, the Wikimedia Foundation developers. Um, so we'll get started with the first talk with uh, Gabriel Subu. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And so today, I'm, uh, we're going to Gabriel and I are going to talk about uh, Parside. And uh, we are a team of five. This is Gabriel. I'm Subu. There's Mark sitting here, there's Arlo, and there's Scott. And uh, we have an etherpad up there. If you have any notes or thoughts and comments, please feel free to add it there. It's also linked from the schedule description page. Also the slides. So our objectives, first and foremost, as uh, the title indicated, is to reduce or eliminate the need for anyone who needs to use Wikipedia content to have to deal with Wikitext directly. And uh, there have been a lot of attempts to uh, deal with Wikitext parsing and all kinds of hacks. And so we are hoping that with Parser, you don't have to do any of that anymore. And for that to, be, to happen, we have to ensure that uh, we are able to convert it in Wikitext and HTML5 faithfully in both directions. So you can use it for both editing Wikitext and for editing HTML. And uh, this also means that we're hoping to leverage uh, the HTML that Parser generates as a storage format. And uh, this will help us improve site performance and possibly enable other new features. And uh, as part of that, so anything that traditionally had been done with Wikitext, text, like uh, templating, uh, widgets, diffing, abuse filters, we had to think about how we would do that with uh, HTML. So what makes this a hard problem? I mean, why is it hard to convert between Wikitext text and HTML? Uh, because we don't want to introduce dirty diffs. That's one of the biggest uh, concerns. So this uh, slide here shows a uh, diff after uh, using Visual Editor and Parsoid, and where we introduce a lot of unnecessary changes. If you look at the top, it's just supposed to have been a minor typo fix. But uh, because of some uh, bugs, we, we had a lot of changes which are unnecessary. So this is one of the biggest concerns. We don't want to introduce any dirty diffs as part of the translation. And uh, there are a bunch of reasons why uh, that's complicated. It's first of all, there are a lot of syntactic variations in Wikitext. So uh, you can have spaces, you can have uh, different kinds of quotation, you can have different casing. And as the last uh, bullet shows, links can be, they all render identically, but the links you can write very differently. So when you go from HTML back to Wikitext, you want to get the same thing back. And the other thing is that there's a lot of broken Wikitext out there because Wikitext is hard. And uh, so in the first example, you have a missing uh, closing tag. And the second example, the tags don't nest properly as per HTML semantics. And in the third example, the content foo there doesn't really belong there. And if you render it, you'll see that foo will show up outside the table. And there are a whole bunch of other scenarios. Uh, talk to us if you want to know more. And uh, also, templates. Templates are used a lot on Wikitext pages. Anything uh, that's non-trivial uses templates. And, uh, but templates are, come in all kinds. And one of the things that we have to deal with are unbalanced templates, something that don't uh, generate a well-balanced DOM structure. 
So in this example, where the echo template is just rendering an opening div tag and not the entire div structure that you would see in a browser. And these are very fairly common. This is not a contrived example. So football tables and succession tables, and you'll see an example there. That whole s a snippet there, a bunch of templates is generating the table on the right. And so when we uh, deal with it, when we parse this, we have to make sure that the whole thing is encapsulated as a single structure. So how did we do it? Uh, it took a lot of uh, uh, a lot of effort, and of course, a whole bunch of algorithms. And uh, it's well known that I mean, a lot of people have tried to uh, parse wiki text as just like regular language grammars, and it's not really possible because there are a lot of context-sensitive bits there. So the way we handle it is by uh, convert the wiki text into tokens, and then. Uh, transform it based according to whether it's a list or a pre or a paragraph, and then deal with the DOM. And uh, once the DOM is built, we do a lot of additional passes and transformations. We kind of try to map wiki text ranges to uh, the DOM structure that it produced. We try to find template scopes and so on. And when we go back, in order to prevent any uh, dirty diffs, we have to restore any syntactic variations that we kind of uh, normalized as part of the parsing and any HTML fix-ups that we made to fix errors that we have to undo. And uh, the most important thing is, even despite all that, we'll introduce diffs if we uh, serialize the whole thing from scratch. So what we do is when uh, an editor like Visual Editor makes gives us back the new HTML, we just do a diff of the original and the new HTML, and only use a serialization for the modified HTML. And the, re the way we uh, verify accuracy is by doing a lot of automated testing. So we started with about 400 odd uh, parser test cases that we got from uh, the core parser. And over time, this has now increased to about 1,200 odd parser uh, tests. So they spec the behavior when we go from Wikitext to HTML and HTML to Wikitext, and there are a lot of edge cases. And we have a runner which runs this in about five modes. And uh, effectively, this means about 23,000 tests run across all modes whenever we make a commit. The other thing that's very critical for deploy is that we also do a lot of round trip testing on production pages. So we are running our tests uh, on before product uh, every night on about 160,000 pages from about uh, 10 to 15 wikis, I think. And uh, what it does is takes Wikitext, converts to HTML, and goes back to Wikitext. And uh, based on that, we have a technique to figure out whether the diffs we found are meaningful or not. And so as this slide shows that uh, we also have uh, I mean, the most important thing we concentrate on are regressions. And if there are any regressions, that's when we kind of stop a deploy. And sometimes these are just false reports. And if we used a seltzer that is selective serialization that I talked about earlier, then uh, we just find that in this case, there are only nine diffs and mostly new line diffs out of all the pages that we ran. And the most, and the other, the other thing we also do is try to collaborate with the community. and. Uh, we have been monitoring uh, feedback on various pages, especially the visual editor uh, uh, feedback page, and try to fix problems as we uh, find them. And we also, once in a while, fix uh, broken templates. And now I'll let Gabriel talk about how we can use Parsite. So the easiest way to use Parsite is to use the web API. We provide one. This is actually the production instance that is powering visual editor and other applications. Um, you can just use it. Um, it has a very simple uh, interface. You just um, do a GET request to retrieve a page. This prefix in there is the database prefix. That's the most complicated part of the API, really. So English wiki is called and wiki. Uh, DU wiki, DU wiki, well, you get the, get the pattern. And there's other projects, too, like uh, media wiki is media wiki wiki, and, and so on, other projects. Um, then when you want to convert it back to, or do any kind of conversion um, between HTML to Wikitext or Wikitext to HTML, you can do a POST request <laughs> and either pass in an HTML POST parameter, in which case, in case you get uh, the Wikitext back, or um, pass in the Wikitext get back HTML. So it's fairly straightforward. You can also always pass in old IDs if you want to um, make sure you get an old version or a specific version, nobody else edited it in the meantime. Otherwise, you, if you leave it out, you get the latest version. Um, the documentation is on, on the wiki, you see there, um, but it's really not more complicated than that. 
Um, what this gives you is a very clean HTML5 structure that is, is actually specced and um, where you can easily identify uh, specific bits of content. For example, a wiki link is marked up as MW wiki links within an attribute and using RDFA. And an external link is similarly marked, as a, uh, marked up as MW ext link. Uh, ex in a transclusion is marked up as a, using a type of attribute and it gives you all the semantic information right in line in data MW. So you can see um, the name of the t uh, template is in there called foo and uh, all the parameters are listed as well. So um, this makes it possible to edit this or to massage the output in specific ways by stripping out some templates or um, modifying its, its uh, output. It also encapsulates um, the entire output of the template using, even if there's multiple children returned, using the about attribute. So each children gets the same about, so you can uh, protect it, for example, in Visual Editor. People don't, shouldn't be able to click into template output and edit it and then be surprised that it wasn't actually saved because the template just regenerates it. Um, this is, th these are some examples of how you can use this programmatically. You can just use DOM uh, selectors to retrieve specific kinds of elements. For example, get all the images. This is a little bit more complicated because we have different kinds of images. Um, get all the wiki links, that's very straightforward. Transclusion is also very straightforward because it's just an attribute match. And then you can walk through, get a, you get a list back, can walk through them, do something with them. So if you want to use this to extract uh, semantic information for wiki data, for um, metadata, for, for comments, whatever, it's very straightforward to do. Um, this is used by tools like this, for example. This is a um, PDF renderer that we, uh, Scott actually worked on. Um, this is converting the parsed output to LaTeX, also making use of all the semantic information, for example, extracting the, the image parameters, the caption, and so on, and uh, yeah, renders this to nice PDFs. Um, the QX offline reader is also taking advantage of this by removing specific templates, rewriting the um, image sources to local files and, and massaging like that, but it's all very straightforward without having to deal with wiki text at all. They used to maintain their own parser as well, one of the long list of parsers out there that are kind of doing okay-ish, uh, implement one part of this, the syntax or another, but um, they don't have to anymore. Um, Visual Editor, of course, that was is the biggest user and was also the um, reason why we started this project. And the way it works is um, it edits the Parseed HTML and then sends it back to Parseed to get the edited wiki text, which is then saved to the wiki. So in this case, we go from wiki text to HTML, modify it, then back uh, to wiki text. Um, similarly, Edit Protected Helper, that's a, bot, um, a gadget that uh, makes it very easy to pr um, edit protected pages. Uh, does the same thing in a gadget very easily with, with jQuery and paste, uh, puts this back. Content Translation Project, that's a major one. Um, it enables you to easily translate um, content from one wiki to another, and it also takes advantage of all the semantic markup by um, adapting links, uh, easily identifying the content at all, so you can be fed through machine translation tools, eventually also adapting uh, template parameters between wikis. Flow uses Parsuite uh, in a different way. Uh, Flow is actually storing HTML and uh, provides a wiki text editor user interface. So in, in this case, we go from HTML to Wikitext, then let the user edit, and then uh, save the edited um, Wikitext back as HTML. This uh, lets Flow um, perform relatively well because you don't have to parse each post separately uh, when you see a complete thread. Uh, Lintbridge is, an, is a project that uh, we helped with recently. It's a Google Sum of Code project that uses a lot of information that is available internally in Parsuit to uh, detect errors and flag them and categorize them in a database. Uh, so in this example, there's an, a deprecated tag 
there's, we have all kinds of other classes like uh, foster parenting, where there's content in a table that is moved out. Um, unclosed tags are very common. And uh, so we have, we have a database now, and um, the plan for the, is to use this to uh, fix up m some of the more uh, very broken wiki tags that is very hard to deal with and uh, makes editing and so on harder than necessary. So there's some edge cases that uh, Parsley doesn't actually handle or that is very hard to handle, and we hope that eventually by, by working with the community on this, uh, we can improve the be behavior for everybody by fixing up some of the worst problems. Um, and there's other use cases. In some cases, we didn't even know uh, about them. For example, there was a Czech, or is a Czech Slovak uh, translation tool that was came before the more general content translation tool um, that we only learned about when our test uh, server was down. Mm -hmm. Somebody came on RSC and told us, hey, your, your server is down. I'm using it for this cool project to translate back and forth between Czech and Slovak Google, using Google Translate and uh, creating new pages there. And uh, there's offline, another offline project by Scott. And yeah, if you have anything else that you're using it for we don't, that we should know about, please add it to the either pad or tell us here. Um, so the next steps. Um, we want to support more things like language variants. That's a very tricky area. Um, there are non-Wikipedia projects. We had some discussions here already uh, for uh, Wikisource. And then switching between HTML and wiki text and visual editor, that would also be nice, but it's, it's very difficult um, because of something we come to later. Um, edge case handling is an ongoing thing that basically will continue forever. Here's always something you can improve. The next big step, however, is HTML pipe page views. So we want to use this parsed HTML for um, actually serving a normal page view outside of visual editor. And um, it already looks pretty nice, but um, there's more to do. But the, why, why are we trying to do this? Um, so one of the motivations is to enable new ways to view and edit the content by, by using the semantic markup. Um, it also, by already using the same HTML that is also necessary for editing, we can directly switch to edit view without actually reloading the page. And because it's also rendered exactly the same when you while you edit, we can also directly switch back to view mode after on saving without actually waiting for something to parse. So there's a lot of performance uh, potential there around editing. And, and we also, of course, want to m avoid maintaining two parsers or render pipelines in the longer term. So right now we have the PHP parser and, uh, and parse it, and um, eventually we will, when parse it is good enough, we will uh, use only one. The other big motivation is uh, we want to improve logged in page view performance. Right now, when you are logging in, you actually uh, get slow uh, performance rather than the better one. Um, that's because um, th those requests are not cached. Normally, when you're log when you're an anonymous user, you just get very fast static HTML. And when you're logged in, there's all kinds of user preferences and so on that are implemented in PHP. So um, this is even from the client side, so it includes all the network connectivity. If you just look at it from the server side, it's, the difference is even more dramatic because you cut out the network, which is constant. Um, the way we want to do this is to make it basically static, to use the same HTML for everybody and move all these bits of user preferences to the client side. Um, another very interesting thing uh, is stable element IDs that um, the idea is basically to assign an ID to each HTML element. And the tricky bit is to keep this ID stable across wiki text edits. So basically allows you to preserve information that is not, cannot be directly uh, represented in wiki text across these edits. Um, once we have that, that is not currently yet done and it's, it's very researchy actually. Um, but it will enable a lot of the association of a lot of extra metadata. So you can key on this ID and then associate extra stuff with it. For example, um, retrieve uh, extra semantic information and then use it for extra displays, inline displays of references. Blame maps, that's something you can build up that will be prohibitively expensive to serve directly. But uh, if you have IDs, you can associate it with a part of the page and then display it while hovering over it. 
all kinds of other things like um, content translation tracking. That would be very nice if we could keep track of this. These, this was originally translated from this paragraph and uh, maintain that relationship and then maybe later suggest, oh, you could also translate this other paragraph. And probably more ideas. So that's more feature. But to get there, we have to make sure that we actually render this very well. And um, the way we do this is we do a lot of um, automated diffing, visual diffing, by basically take two, taking two screenshots, overlaying them, and then comparing the pixels. And um, we see in this example, it has some small, these, these uh, purple bits, are the small differing bits, and it seems to be some shifting here, some CSS issue, and probably a small icon at the top. So it's a fairly minor thing. We are not tweaking the CSS to match the PHP output, basically. Um, to back this all up, is, uh, we will need an API that uh, lets us provide all the information that is needed to do, implement user preference and so, and so on on the client side. For that, we are working on a storage um, and, and content API that can actually handle the high request volume that we need to handle and is cacheable. Um, it's backed by a storage service uh, that is more an architectural project um, that provides internal users stable storage similar to uh, one of the bigger NoSQL uh, distributed data, uh, stores. And on top of that, it exposes a bucket blob interface similar to Amazon S3 or some of the other services. And the idea is to make it easy to develop new things and to make it highly performant. It uses Cassandra and performs pretty well. It will be available this quarter. The interface for that is very straightforward. Again, just a REST API. So this is actually what the Parsuit API will look like in the future. You just retrieve the HTML. It will uh, implicitly generate it if it's not yet there. Uh, and you will also be able to save it back. Or you can work on Wikitext by retrieving that, edit it, and save it back. So it's a generic content API. And it also lets you retrieve other properties like uh, Data MW, which in the future will have uh, all the parameters for transclusions, for example. Um, it also provides some listings, so, but uh, so we can list all the revisions for a given property for HTML, for example. And um, yeah, it will eventually expand beyond that. But this is the first use case. All right, that's it from me. And I'm happy to take questions. We are happy to take questions. Convert to. I'm, I'm not sure what, what kind of JSON. So, in other words, I, I'm thinking of a different kind of use for, let's say, a, kind of a bot use in a way. So, in other words, you don't want to have the bot parse the wiki text, you want to have it pre parse for you. So, you would have the, the, the templates that exist and when the wiki text already pre parsed and sent to you as a JSON output. Uh, so, there's JSON inline in the HTML, but you would prefer to have only. Uh, parameters or something like that? I, I think the way you do it, you, you get back the HTML, you can extract with a, a query selector query all the templates, they're marked um, with uh, a MW transfusion, a type of attribute. And then there's an attribute in the HTML, I don't think we showed what yeah. templates look like in the HTML, okay. but there's a, right. there's an attribute which has all the parameters for that template. So I do that in the PDF render, for example. I render, I, I look for certain templates, like the templates which do two mm -hmm. images wide. Yes. I pull out the arguments and I. You know. That's basically that. And, and the arguments are provided as a JSON embedded inside the HTML attributes. Yeah. No, yeah. There you that go. gets you all these elements, and they have data MW in there. So you're looking for that MW transclusion oh, okay. to make the data. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I understand. So this, this isn't. I guess if it was the artwork template, I guess is what I'm kind of thinking of. It would be much larger. Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, that only has one parameter. The parameter is that one. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
Thanks. Um, what the plan to like serve the preservation of the people? Would having all this extra semantic stuff in there produce a lot of like size overhead in the HTML page, or is it not that much? Yeah, it would. Um, the the thing I alluded to earlier. Yeah, yeah, it would. Right now, it actually adds a lot. Um, this we don't even show all the information. It has another attribute called data parse suite, which has all these round trip bits that we use to undo fix ups and so on. That's even bigger. And um, we are moving this out right now with the storage service, where we store it in a separate JSON blob, also associated with the content through the ID. And so. It will actually no longer be inline like it's shown here. Instead, you retrieve a JSON block called DataMW. It has all the um, template parameters and uh, is keyed as just one big object based on the ID. So uh, there's two different sorts of types. Like the, some of the semantic information is like the wiki link versus X link there. And more or less what we're doing there is just providing more standard HTML for these things. Right now, we have, I think, classes in the HTML which mark the same thing. So there you're not really expanding the HTML so much as we're shifting to a more semantic HTML um, markup and shifting the CSS classes to match. Yeah, but once this is all moved out, uh, the overhead should be really low. So in, in the first measurements, we just stripped it out and it was even smaller than the PHP output. But I guess once we add the IDs back in, uh, the compressed size should be pretty even. Thank you very much. Great, great work. Very exciting ahead. I was just curious, how much difference is there um, to get Ursa working on different language versions right now? Is it are these sort of small internationalization, localization tweaks? Or are they are they quite large between language editions? Language are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, so, so uh, uh, right now, language support, for example, is very easy because <laughs> it pretty much already works. It's those are just HTML properties anyway. Mm -hmm. um, uh, language converter is what I'm working on this next quarter, and any language which uses language converter doesn't yet work, okay. and that is probably a large project long term, um, because you know it doesn't even parse and parse it yet. I have to get it to parse and parse it, and then eventually a visual editor has to provide some way of editing that, which is completely yeah. up in the air. So, so things like that. If there's anything in between, I went to the Indic meetup last night specifically looking for that, and they did mention issues, but I'm I'm very interested, come find me if you have some language which has some issue in between just right to left support, which should just work, sure. and language converter, which I know doesn't work. Anything else I'd like to fix? Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think some of the biggest areas have been um, wiki customization, so we retrieve the configuration for each wiki, including stuff like the link prefix, regex, and so on. And there's also a ton of aliases for image options, for example, that we all have to support. Supported. Yeah, and that's all supported. So yeah. it's very generic. If you plug in a new wiki with completely <laughs> different areas, it should just work. Pretty much anything that comes from the site info API, we support. If your wiki has some customization which doesn't show up in the site info API, then we need to talk. Fair enough. Thank you. So, John, I presented HTML generator as a distinction between loading and loading, right? So is there any plan to provide that support also? Yes, yes. Um, we will provide an API that basically, right now the idea is to provide, basically provide an array of links that don't actually exist in the page. So in a typical Wikipedia article, that is probably going to be an empty array. But uh, yeah, if you just create a new page, then there might be some more in there. And then do the rendering client side. There's all kinds of user preferences around that too. I, I believe you can still select a question mark behind the word or I don't know, I have a blink, possibly. Uh, so yeah, we can do that client side without diluting the cache. So we can still use the same HTML for everything. So there will be a generic API that you can just hit, give me the red links for this page. I think we better wrap it up now. Thanks very much. So that was Gabriel and Subu on Parsoid. Um, we've now got Chris McMahon uh, talking about finding and fixing bugs.
So, my name is Chris McMahon. My title at the foundation, at the Wikimedia Foundation, is Quality Assurance Lead. Um, and uh, uh, before I start, I wanted to mention a couple of things. One is that I'm really pleased to have this opportunity. Um, QA at the foundation supports literally every development project we have. We have testing for mobile front end, visual editor, flow. Uh, we have community projects like math extensions. We are everywhere, but we're really behind the scenes. We are really uh, not very prominent. It's a real pleasure to get to talk to you about my work. Second thing is that I want to distinguish between software testing and quality assurance. And software testing is an activity that's done by human beings. That investigate software looking for issues. We test it. We want to make sure that the user experience is good, that the controls function the way we expect. Quality assurance, though, that's about processes. It's about systems. Um, we want to create systems in which software testing is valuable, in which software testing is valid. And that's really my work. I work on the systems and the processes much more than I work on actually testing software. And these systems that I'm about to describe to you are all new. I was hired two and a half years ago, and I was the first person with QA in his title at the foundation. And we had nothing along these lines. So we're finding and fixing issues for the Wikipedias. And two and a half years ago, the way this worked, so we had a local development environment, works on my machine, right? When we got everything working on the local development environment, a couple of times a year, we put that software out to the Wikipedias. 
And you know, you, as you may expect, this was not all that effective. People would have to fix bugs in production, and it was, took a lot of effort and overhead, and sometimes we brought the site down. And uh, shortly after I was hired, we started working on several different processes. Today, we work in our local development environments, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. We have a number of systems in place now between your local development environment and production. I'm going to talk in particular about the tests that I work on, the automated browser tests, user interface tests. And they start in our code repository. There, there's always been Git is our repository, Garrett is our code review tool. And one thing that's always pleased me when I arrived, I found code review has been part of the Wikipedia culture since the very beginning. And I think it's, you can make a case that Wikipedia would never have been successful without the, the diligent code review from the very beginning. But there are really three legs of software quality. One is code review, one is automated tests, and the third is, is fast feedback. These days uh, are continuous integration. So today, we do code review, and when everyone working in the code, and all this code, core, extensions, configuration, operations, everything, when the code is reviewed and accepted, we merge that code to what we call the master branch. We run one branch of code, and it's called the master branch. And one of the things I was responsible for is bringing about a test environment called Beta Labs. One of the things in software testing we have, we have an oracle problem. You know, if the code works in my local, if, if the code is broken in my local development environment and it works in your local development environment, who's right? Do we even know if it's going to work in production or not? And the answer is no. Um, Beta Labs, two years ago, was a mess. Today, Beta Labs is a very accurate, small-scale model of the Wikipedia cluster itself. It inherits its configuration from production, and, uh, and it looks, it, it is built, it has caching, it has database slaves, it has everything, but it's very, on a very small scale. And it's totally self-contained. We can do very destructive things in Beta Labs that we just simply could not do on a production node. And one of the beautiful things about Beta Labs is it runs the master branch of code all the time. Every three minutes, we update the code on Beta Labs 24 hours a day, all the core, all the extension, every three minutes, Beta Labs gets the master branch of code. So you're always guaranteed to be working with the very latest of all the code, all the extensions. We update the databases automatically every three hours, I think, in Beta Labs. And Beta Labs is our primary target for automated browser tests. I want to describe how this works. Our code. The, the automated browser tests are also code. They're also kept in the repositories for the features that they test. They are also checked into the master branch after code review. And at least twice a day, we run all of our automated test builds for all of our features from the continuous integration server at Jenkins. And when we do this, we pull down the, the, the branches of code, the master branch of code for all of our various extensions. We kick off a build, we crew, the Jenkins puts all of our infrastructure together and we decide what's going to be tested for this particular build. And we call out over the internet to a service provided by a company called Sauce Labs. And Sauce Labs was actually founded by the inventor of Selenium, which is the browser driver tool that we use. They're great proponents of open source and they're great supporters of uh, Wikipedia. Really lovely people to work with. And Sauce provides us we call out over the internet and we say, Sauce Labs, please give me a brand new, fresh virtual machine running the operating system of my choice with the browser that I want on that operating system. And Sauce Labs does this, they do it fast, they do it securely, and they give us a wealth of diagnostic material that we would not otherwise be able to provide for ourselves. It's a really wonderful service. And then the browser at Sauce Labs calls out to the Beta Labs test environment. And then that all comes back. I mean, the diagnostics from SOS get reported back to Jenkins. We read the results of the test. Um, and then we go find out on Beta Labs what's going on with the software. So I'd, I'd like to stop here and ask if there's any questions at this point. This all makes sense to everyone? 
Thank you. <laughs> so I want to talk now about what happens when a test fails. I have an example here. Here's what it looks like in Jenkins. Um, Z. Brent would appreciate this. This is a, a build for a universal language, the universal language selector tests. And as you can see, the build was really green there for July 7, July 8, July 9, July 10. And then overnight on July 10th, the build turns red. So we don't really know why, but, but this is what it looks like when a test starts to fail. And I explain this to people a lot. They, they come to me and say, Chris, why do we have so many red tests? And I said, this is awesome. Red tests give us information. Red tests tell us what's going on in the world. Having your test be green all the time is just boring. So there's four ways that a browser test can fail. These are the really important ones. One is that there's a bug in the feature. I mean, something that used to work has stopped working. Some text that used to be there is no longer there. Uh, something is just wrong. And the other thing, the, and another really brilliant aspect of Beta Labs is that it does inherit from production. Something is wrong with Beta Labs itself. If there's something wrong with the configuration of Beta Labs, that can and will propagate to the production environment. We had an issue just uh, not long ago at all, um, Nick would appreciate this, where we had um, accidentally misconfigured the search parameters such that search was working brilliantly for everything except the template namespace. So, so our searches in, in the template namespace on Beta Labs were failing for some really bizarre ways. Um, and this was absolutely an issue that could very well have propagated to production had we not found it and fixed it in the Beta Labs test environment. But there's other ways that tests can fail also. And these get a little trickier because our tests are code. We write our tests in the Ruby programming language and they have to keep step with the features that they're being tested. These features are being updated, changed, retired all the time and our tests have to keep pace with those. This is a big part of my work is, maintain, is maintain, maintaining the tests that exist today. Also, there's sometimes there's a, just a problem. There's an internet problem. Here's an error where Sauce Labs shuts down the VM if uh, it doesn't get any instructions in 90 seconds. And in this case, I don't really know what happened, but we stopped talking to our browser for some reason. It's the internet, it's Beta Labs, something goes wrong. But we're not done with testing yet. Beta Labs is brilliant. It's our primary target. But what we do in QA anymore these days is part of the release engineering team. And the way we do this, shortly after I was hired, we went to a two-week release cycle to production. Today, we have a one-week release cycle. And what happens is, as you remember, we're running the master branch on Beta Labs, constantly updating. Once a week, on Thursday morning Pacific time in the US, we cut what we call a release branch. We take all the code, the master branch that's expected to be correct, and we cut every Thursday morning, we cut a release branch, but we don't put that branch onto production. Not, well, not exactly yet. Um, we have two very special test environments. Um, just as the English Wikipedia is a node on the cluster, the German Wikipedia is a node on the cluster, the Hebrew Wikipedia is a node on the cluster, we have two nodes on the production cluster that are very special. One is MediaWiki.org, and the other is the Test2 Wiki, we call it. Um, these nodes are special. One of the things about production, we have the ability to run different branches on different nodes. If that's clear. So every Thursday, when we cut a potential release branch, we release it only to these two target nodes on the production cluster. And these nodes, they share the same database as production. They share the same configuration as production. The only thing that differs is the branch of code that they run. And they're always running the branch one week ahead of production. And Test2Wiki is our target for automated tests. We do really destructive things out on Test2Wiki. It's ugly. There's nothing there you want to look at. MediaWiki.org, though, is very different. MediaWiki.org is our developer hub. This is where we keep our documentation for everything, as well as our management decisions, 
If you haven't visited MediaWiki.org, I really recommend that you do. It has hundreds, if not thousands, of users. And so when we put our pre-release branch out there, we have hundreds, if not thousands, of users who are using our potentially releasable software. And this is really what it takes. Real human beings need to engage with the software. You cannot do this work with automation alone. You cannot do quality work with automation alone. So if we've done something wrong, if something goes terribly wrong, we will hear about it from our users, our very sophisticated users on MediaWiki.org. Um, and as I said, Test2Wiki is of interest because, well, you, you can go see it if you want, but I recommend if you haven't gone to MediaWiki.org yet, please do. And only then, we take our code, we merge it to master branch after code review, we put it in beta labs, constantly we're constantly investigating the software both human eyeballs and automated tests are constantly working with this software we cut a potential release branch every week we put that branch out on the test nodes for real human beings for more automation and only then do we put it to production where you get to see it on the wikipedias so as i said we're behind the scenes and and what i noticed over the two years I've been working with, we used to have discussions with users about reliability and how things didn't work the way they were expected and how we had to fix bugs in production. And these days that really doesn't happen so much. These days we argue about things that work as they're expected to work. This is a much better sort of discussion to have. Any questions at this point? So there's one more thing I'd like to show you. I'd like to, as I said, we are all kind of behind the scenes. I'd like to, to introduce you to some of the people that I work with. We are a multinational distributed team. I live and work in Tucson, Arizona. Antoine Musto is in France. He is our, the primary system administrator for the beta labs, and he is also the maintainer of the Jenkins continuous integration system. <laughs> Antoine is brilliant. He's been part of the Wikipedia for a very long time. My colleague Jelko Filpin works in Croatia. Uh, he's the architect of our browser test automation framework. Uh, he and I have known each other for long years before either of us ever started working for the foundation. I'm really privileged to work with him. He is also our main browser test support for our primarily European projects like the language team and Wikidata. Um, Andre Clapper is our bug wrangler. Uh, Andre marshals all of the issues that are being reported for all of the projects all of the time, and he makes absolutely certain that critical issues do not go unfixed and get the attention that they deserve. Uh, Greg Grossmeyer is in San Francisco. Oh, uh, Andre is in the Czech Republic, by the way. Greg Grossmeyer is here at Wikimania. He's our release manager. He's in San Francisco. He juggles all of the release schedules. He knows which features are going to which wikis, in which order, at which time, and who's responsible for every single one of them. It's a big job, and Greg is a really brilliant young man. As, and as I said, uh, we can't do this with automation alone. We, uh, we require human beings to work with the software. Rumana Yasmin is our QA tester. She's based in San Francisco. Uh, she is primarily working with our editing team and she is a brilliant young woman and can find the most picky issues and has an incredible sense of detail and an incredible work ethic. It's, it's a real pleasure working with her. And finally, I want to go back. Do you remember Works on My Machine? Do you remember our local development environment? Two years later, now that... Are, are now that we have all of this structure from the master branch, from the instant that code is merged to the master branch to the point where it's put on production Wikipedias, we have this pretty much nailed. We know how this works. We're now focusing effort upstream from that. We would like to improve the, lo the experience for the local development environment. And a man named Ori Livney, and I think Ori is here, uh, started work with a virtual technology called Vagrant. And we've been building local development environments with Vagrant, but it was really tough to keep them maintained 
to uh, support all of the dependencies. We've hired a man. Dan Duvall is our brand new automation engineer and he is working very hard right now to improve their development experience on, a sh on local development environments. But we want to make these local development environments consistent, reliable, every bit as reliable a model as beta labs. And again, we want to make our, our users experience in production as good as we possibly can. That's all I have, but I have uh, 10 minutes left. Um, I can show you some things if you'd like. I can show you, uh, I can run a test. I can show you Jenkins. I, I would, uh, if you're interested in, in this, this might be of interest to James. Uh, my visual editor test uh, failed overnight. Um, if you'd like to see off here on the left side, you can see it was green all day yesterday and then overnight it failed. And I, I can give you an example of, of some of the diagnostic abilities that we have here. I can look at my red build here in Jenkins and I can click through and I can see that I have a single failure. I have a test called multi-edit workflow, make multiple edits to the same article. My multi-edit workflow has failed overnight and so I can click through and I see it, I expected a certain string to exist in the results of the test, but that string isn't there. So it expected this string to be there, but it's not there. And why is it not there? And I can click through to the Sauce Labs job and I can tell you, Sauce Labs is gonna show me Sauce Labs takes a screenshot at every failure point. Plus it gives you a, a playback, a video playback as well. This is just amazing stuff. This is wonderful. But I can see that I've never seen that before. <laughs> it says your edit was saved. This is a brand new feature. I don't know what this is. I need to figure out what's going on with this. Is James, is this VE or is it getting started? What's that? Growth team. Growth team, that's what I figured. Is this our getting started? people they uh they are inserting encouragement to editors at various places like uh when you log in or when you make an anonymous edit or in this case much to my surprise and to the surprise of my automated test we have some encouragement for new editors that made my test fail it's non-deterministic yes non-deterministic is bad okay we need to we need to handle that um but anyway, I, I just want to show you, uh, I love watching this stuff. I just think it's incredibly effective. Um, I would also like to show you, just because I can. See, what now? You know, I'm going to do you even better than that. I'm just going to run a bunch of visual editor tests for you right now. Um, I have probably, what, five more minutes? Can I have answer any questions while uh, this runs in the background? How's uh, fabricating it? Uh, initially, Fabricator is expected to take over Bugzilla. That's going to be our first step. Instead of reporting problems and issues in Bugzilla, we'll report them in Fabricator. Uh, down the road, Fabricator is probably going to take over from Garrett as our code review tool. Uh, it's unclear at this point where, how we'll integrate it with Jenkins, but um, it, that's probably coming as well. Any other questions? Yes. So you run your tests against the shared instance? Yes, well, you can run it against any target that you want. Um, we have people, for example, targeting uh, vagrant test environments, which uh, the URL would be just be 127.0.0.1, local host, right? You can point this at, at any target you want. Um, we did, uh, the mobile team is actually notorious because a number of their tests uh, targeted the production environment, and they would forget to uh, stop that when they made the test actually edit pages. So the Selenium test user is actually now blocked on the English Wikipedia, thanks to our mobile team. <laughs> we, we actually mark the tests as to what environment they're, they're safe to run against. Yeah, and some people fail to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, in the back there, please. How, how often would you say you get tests um, which fail non-deterministically or, or randomly or whatever? Often. <laughs> rarely. Um, well, well, browser tests maybe rarely, but unit tests quite often. That's that's a little different. Um, 
And when you say non-deterministically, the thing about browser tests, you have to you have to understand. And as I pointed out, I mean, there's a lot of risk because we have to do a lot of work on the Jenkins host. And then we have to reach over the internet to talk to a third party, and that third party has to reach over the internet to talk to our our test environment, which may be having its own issues. Um, so, so I would not use the term non-deterministic. It's very deterministic, but all sorts of problems can happen in that chain. And as I said, I like red tests. Red tests tell me what's going on. So, uh, so I would, how many, how often do tests fail not because of software bugs? That, that's pretty often. They, uh, I do get a lot of test failures for issues other than actual problems in the software. Um, this is part and parcel of doing this work with automated browser tests. It's everyone's experience. So when I commit a, a patch to core, it commits without running these, uh, these browser tests. True. Uh, yeah, our builds kick off on a timer and not per commit. Um, and they can be run by hand, which I often do as well. How, how uh, what's the plan for the future? Is there a future in which my commit could get reverted or something? Where I'm willing to wait 20 minutes because I'm nervous whenever I commit to core. We'll talk. Uh, um, this keeps coming up. I keep saying no because I'm not sure that I'm on board with it. Um, maybe if we have a, if we could host a reliable Vagrant instance on Gallium, where Jenkins is, I'd be a lot more enthusiastic. Um, but uh, you know, it's, we tried something like that. We tried running uh, headless Firefox actually on Gallium host, and we actually brought Gallium to its knees because it turns out you can only have a few XVFB processes before the Jenkins host just drags to a halt. Any other questions? I got two more minutes. I have one more question, James. Why do we have test and test two wiki? Test, uh, well, <laughs> historically, <laughs> well, uh, historically, talk to Chad. But but in in practical terms, test and test two used to share. We used to have different file systems. Today, they no longer do. Um, the difference between test and test two is that I've taken a lot of care to configure test two in such a way that the preferences are set for my user the way I want it. Common.js is correct. The common CSS is correct. Um, test is the wild west. People do all sorts of weird stuff out on test wiki and I don't care. As long as they leave test two alone, um, yeah, I don't care. Uh, so. Anything, any other questions? Yes? Does anybody here know how to properly import a template in a test, in a unit test? Special export. Using special export from the, well, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. So that was Chris uh, McMahon talking about finding and fixing bugs. We're now continuing the discussion, really. Is um, Cbrand here? So we now have a session on um, asking the developers questions, anything you like. So what we need here is some developers. So maybe. Pardon? Um, we don't, unfortunately. But I think if we will shout. I don't like the forum format for it. I want to add it. Well, uh, uh, hi everyone. Um, I want to ask you if everyone in the back wants to come a bit to the front, so we can talk among each other and we don't have to yell to be able to, to hear each other. I would like to not uh, have people sit behind a desk being extreme experts because I think we're all equals. Ideally, we do this in a fishbowl, but we don't have a fishbowl here. What about the listeners? Okay. Worst type of room for this type of uh, session. Sorry, uh, James, you said something? What about the remote people? 
when they watch the recording. Is there, is there a, uh, it's like it's a being recorded somewhere? It's not live. He means when it gets recorded for people to watch later. You need to use microphones, otherwise they can't we, hear. We don't have a mic, we don't have a mic. So what, okay, so I propose this. If someone wants to say something, they come here, they sit behind the chair and they yell in the microphone. And then they move away again, and then someone else sits in front of the microphone. Is that what we do? It's going to be a very slow process, but maybe it's like a talking stick, right? But then fixed position stick. A talking microphone. Yes. All right. I'm staying here. Okay, okay, so so hi. So the idea here is basically um, uh, a lot of people. Who, who here uh, considers themselves a developer? Can you raise a hand? Ah, it's about a uh, 75 to 80 percent of the crowd. That's excellent. A lot better than last year. Um, it's it's supposed to be an open uh, discussion. We want to take a few minutes per topic, ideally. Um, if you have a lot of questions. Um, don't expect them all to be answered because there's more people that want to ask questions. First. I think we're going to skip that suggestion of James. <laughs> so hi, I'm um, Ed Hyde from um, Public Library of Science. Um, we're investing a little bit in the development of the uh, visual editor, which we think is a fantastic piece of software, best of free editor, and uh, congratulations. Thank you. So, um, Product manager is sitting over there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, we know the controversies within the, the community about the visual editor, and we just wanted to know a little bit about the development cycle and um, and whether the community seems to be okay with it, and um, and if not, whether the development is going to progress regardless. So over there we have James Forrester. James, did you hear the question? Yep. Okay. So can you tell a little bit about the development cycle of Visual Editor, how the community responds to it, etc. And be brief and concise and precise. <laughs> wow. Hello. Hello. So, development of Visual Editor is a complex picture. Um, so code gets rolled out every week to the wikis, whether um, it works or not. Uh, we work really hard so that it does work. And <coughs> there have been two instances in the last year where we've deployed something bad, um, very bad, um, and a few instances where we've not been as happy as we wanted to. Um, I don't ever see there being an end date to development of Visual Editor. Um, I think at some point we're going to ramp down our development. I think that's probably in Last time I said this, I said five to six years, and Eric coughed that he had things further off in the roadmap. So, so certainly it's going to be a while. off. Um, and come to my talk later to hear about all the yeah. great things. When is your talk and where? It's at 4.30, and it's in, I think I'm going to say the Fountain Room. And 4.30, Fountain Room, much more um, about visual editor. But, um, no, so that is not correct. It's, it's not 4.30 in Auditorium 1. It's in Auditorium 1, so the mirror image of this room, but in that direction. Um, to answer the question about how we work with community, I think that's a big open question. Um, and there's a huge amount of variation between different communities um, about how they uh, react to change in general and visual editing specifics. And I'm not sure really that there's a single answer, um, but also we're working together with communities to uh, hopefully get some better answers. Does that satisfy your Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, a great answer. Thank you, Thank you James. Next question. Oh, microphones, wonderful. Oh, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah, let's go ahead. Uh, is it possible to make a personal um, favorite uh, five or ten favorite articles of my own as a registered uh, uh, user? Like there is a personal watch list. Articles that I like to go back and see and even though there were, there were no changes so I don't have to type the name but see the favorites. Um, yeah I, can, I think I can answer that question I think that if you go to um, your preferences and then to the what and then to the watch list tab 
uh, you can also watch your complete watch list with links. So yes, that, that is a feature that is available. I think it's three clicks away, but it's, okay. it's already there. Pass. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, curious, I'm an academic researcher, and one of the, the challenges with some of the academic research is separating out um, edits by bots versus edits by um, by humans. And in some cases, it's say in the the IRC chat, it's clear where there's a bot flag um, set, but that's also an optional sort of whether the bot sets its flag or not. Um, curious if in the development plan or, or how difficult it would be or, or as a developer myself where I could get started to contribute um, if it would be possible to store whether an edit was committed through the API or on site um, maybe that exists and I just have not looking in the right place but but it would be a really useful flag to know if, if an edit came to the API or not. Any volunteers for this? Well Indicating whether an edit was made through the API really wouldn't be all that useful, considering that on the back end, I believe, visual editor goes through the API. So. But, but visual editor mm. uses edits tags. That one tags at least, you know. That's true. Yeah. There will be more and more API users that so I will mm. back to it. <coughs> so, having a permanent tag, like if the user was bot flagged, at the time is something that would be possible, but it would take a lot of working out exactly how it would, would want to work. Mm -hmm. So, too long for a, a quick answer here. Okay, cool. So one thing that I can suggest is that we have a website with a feature request and bugs, bugzilla.wikimedia.org. If you can give a description of your feature request, and if you can give a very precise description of how you would like things to work, then we can start a discussion there. Yeah? There's also, um, we currently have sort of this for the OAuth API, so for external applications that access through the OAuth uh, API, those get tagged individually as to which application you're using based on the API hash. Uh, of your access key, basically. Um, we haven't extended that to general applications, but it's possibly something we could do. Uh, I also wanted to add, there's also a bunch of gadgets that um, will go implicitly through the API, even though they are visually done by a user, not in an automated fashion, but it's just another way to make an edit instead of screen scraping. Um, the bot flag, and there is a proposal on Bugzilla actually to move the bot flag from the recent changes table to the revision table, which would make it f available for researchers permanently instead of just within the first 30 days. Uh, yeah. yeah, the only problem with that is that the bot flag isn't always used on edit because its real meaning is hide this change from recent changes and certain changes by bot aren't intended to be hidden. I, I want to end the discussion, start a new question. Yes, I, I have a question regarding the mobile app. Uh, I have a very old uh, iPod which runs uh, iOS 4.21, I think, so it's completely oh, outdated. Yes, right. And the new Wikipedia app doesn't uh, work on that, and that's not my complaint. I can uh, can understand that at one point you have to stop supporting this old software, but the old app did work on the old iPod. And when I go to the Apple Store and try to install the and now you can't download the uh, compatible version it, anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't even offer me the old version. It simply says the app is not compatible, and that's the end of it. Some other apps apparently uh, do, do that. They tell me this version is not um, compatible with your device, but mm -hmm. there's an old version that you can download. Right. So there must be one way to configure the Apple Store to tell it. Okay. Is there the old anyone app. from the mobile apps team here? I was well, afraid that the was going to be was the answer. Answer. I'm sorry. Is there anyone who, who can say I something can, about this? I can guess. Um, so if I had to guess as to why it happened, it's because the new version of the app was not so much of a fix, but a complete rewrite of the app. So if I had to guess, I would say it was because we didn't want to have to support two mobile apps side by side, um, you know, targeting multiple versions. Once again, you know, that'd really be a question for the mobile apps team, but that would be my guess, is because it was a complete rewrite from the ground up. Also, um, this is 
And if we abuse the, the mic. Ottawa family. Don't do it do we have the next question over Another there? motivation was to um, abuse the auto update features in the app stores so that um, the new rewritten app was automatically pushed out to anyone who had the old app. So it was shipped as a, a new version of the old app for partly that reason. Thanks, Ron. Can we get a next question? Yeah. Just a question about the visual editor. Uh, the visual editor, let's say, uh, when the page is too long, we have problem editing it. I mean, it takes a lot of time for my computer to process. Is there a plan to just uh, parse the paragraphs instead of the whole page? When do you edit this page? Discuss. Um, <laughs> so uh, there are some challenges when you edit um, underneath the level of a document. Uh, most notably, uh, your references are not just numbered wrongly, but they appear from different places. If you want to edit them, you're actually editing them in a different paragraph where yeah. they originally appeared, things like that. Um, there's also the problem with that until Parsoid implements the IDs for individual items on the page, we don't have a way of telling them, by the way, this was the paragraph that we started with and it's changed, rather than this is the same paragraph as before, or a different one. Um, there's also we used to have a really great feature, which is that Internet Explorer 3 used to silently chomp the data at 32 kilobytes in the post form, which meant that users were stopped from writing pages longer than 32 kilobytes. And the site was fast and simple, and it was well written, it was easy to read. And then uh, we stopped supporting Internet Explorer 3, and we got rid of that feature. And now pages are really long, and everything is slow. I think we need to bring back Internet Explorer 3 support. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we need to um, find an issue, a way of fixing that issue because it's not just an issue for really long pages, it's also an issue for people with slower computers, it's an issue in general and we need to fix it, yeah. <coughs> okay. Thank you. I th yeah, that was a question here in the front. So, uh, a bit of a different type of question. Uh, what is it like being a WMF developer? What's your day like? How does it compare to being a developer at a different company or a volunteer developer? Oh, interesting question. How are you, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ooh. I'll take that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been a volunteer developer since 2008, and I've done development work outside the foundation before that. Um, it's very rewarding um, working with a nonprofit and working in free software. I've worked with Fortune 500 companies. I've worked in government. Um, Day to day, um, it's very interesting because we're, we're such a small organization. Um, you know, there's not that many paid staff compared to the you know the the hundreds of thousands of volunteers that we have out there doing other things. So a lot of our work is very interrupt driven. So like we you know we go into work expecting to do something, but then something happens, and because there's only you know. 150 of us like suddenly you have to drop everything that you plan to do that day to handle this you know fire that broke out or, or something along those lines so it's that's the 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 biggest thing that's different i think about the day-to-day -day is is that you go into work not necessarily knowing uh what you're going to do but uh it's very rewarding uh working with the uh the foundation and with the community anybody else on that one Any remote employees? Uh, Chris said a little bit about it earlier. Um, I'm, I'm remote. Um, I, I work for the Wikimedia Foundation 20 hours a week from the Netherlands, from basically my living room. Um, it ha has its advantages uh, because the commute is really short. It's about 15 steps. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, which allows me to do more cycling when I don't fall off uh, my bike. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, and, and, and a disadvantage, of course, is that um, uh, of, of working remote uh, is, is, is that you don't see that many people in real life during your work day. So, um, but luckily, we have these types of events and some other events like hackathons. Um, yeah, that, that allow us to uh, to build the social capital uh, required to uh, uh, to keep good relationships online. Yeah. Can I comment on the question there? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Hey, David. 
Hi. Yeah, one thing that's really important to me is that um, all the work I do is publicly available, which makes a big difference to the effect it will have on my CV. So I don't have to say, I work for this really cool startup and I'd have to kill you if I told you what I did. <laughs> and even better than that, I can potentially even use the work that I've done in, in future jobs because it's licensed appropriately. So I think that's a really big uh, benefit. Yeah, that's, that's a nice addition, yeah. Uh, next question. Don't be shy. Yep, there we go. I've got a question about uh, multimedia support and uh, app. Um, is there currently any plans to enhance the mobile app? Again, it's a question of the mobile app uh, to transform it from just a reader to also one that can capture uh, video, pictures and audio and based on the geolocation, let's say, of the users. So uh, to freelance in Dan's area, because I'm the victim, the product person up on the stage, well, not not on the stage. Um, uh, so the app, mobile apps and the mobile website can both let you edit right now. And the mobile website lets you uh, take photos and upload them to straight to Commons and insert them into the article uh, in, in fact, one button click, as it were, which is kind of cool. And I think the mobile app doesn't yet have that functionality and Lego's waving at me. We are. Oh, there's a Commons app. Yeah, and yeah, there's a Commons app, but that's not been updated for a while, and I don't know. It still works, it still works and it probably still supports uh, more f more phones than than anything. But yeah, um, specifically about video, I don't know. Video is hard, um, mostly because of the encoding on the uh, chip. So phones have hardware encoding to actually do the video, and that encoding is lovely and it's not freely licensed, and we can't put it on commons, and phones generally aren't powerful enough to transcode that, and we don't have community approval to transcode it for the user on the server, so mobile users basically can't, unless they want their phone to turn into a very hot brick, uh, upload anything to commons in terms of video. Um, oops. I'll actually add to the video thing. Um, Brian Vibber talked about this yesterday a little bit. So he's been doing some really interesting experiments with video um, using uh, JavaScript. And he's actually pretty close to some interesting prototypes that will do um, encoding on the phone side. So you would be able to shoot your video in, you know, in high resolution on your phone, do the transcoding on your side, and then upload the, the freely licensed media to comments. You know, I don't think there's any kind of timeline on this. It's you know all pie in the sky kind of experimentation stuff, but it's certainly things that I think people are thinking about because you know mobile is definitely where things are going and. If we want to capture, you know, video and pictures, we have to be able to get it from from the devices that people have. So, next question. May I just make one last comment? I think um, most important thing is to have the geolocation feature, so that the user, the app, can sense where the user is and suggest to them there are this number of articles which is GPS tagged and needs a video because year after year we hear that there's a chronic shortage of video and I think we need to um, let the users know that they can just handily shoot a video and then everything click a button will be done for them in comments maybe up here in top page and then and then at least we can go from being a chronic shortage to be for, afford to be picky thank you so I, I can actually say for a fact that we are going to be bringing more geolocation stuff back to the mobile apps that used to be there and went away. Um, it used to be able to have stuff like articles related to things that are near me and so forth. Um, and that went away for a while, but with the new way that we're storing the geodata information, uh, I was talking with... Uh, who was it? Uh, I was talking with Max the other day, and he said that they're looking at doing that again. So I think that's definitely something with the, the geolocation that they want to go down the road with in mobile. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah, if no one else, oh, there is someone else. Uh, well, next one. No, okay. Okay. Next one will yeah. be there. Right, just a very quick question. Um, again, the visual editor. It looks like it's. Um, Anticipating concurrent editing in the future is that correct? And and if so, we're in the in the kind of anticipated timeline. Is that talk. Come to his talk. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's after the visual editor talk. So. Okay, so it's after the the, the, the visual editor talk at four thirty. Uh, that will be at five, I guess. Then. 
Oh, well, oh it's a long talk. It's oh. five. 4.30 is the visual editor talk, 5 is uh, Eric's talk about how parallel editing is great, and 5.30 is uh, a demo. everyone being wowed by the demo. It sounds like your place to be. Yeah. Now, I note that, uh, okay, that goes a little awkward. Um, I note that uh, lots of people can contribute to the code, not just foundation employees, but uh, what the, I'm just wondering whether contractors are considered like uh, among you or, or, or instead are just pe external people paid to uh, develop our software. In other words, I'm just wondering whether contractors can truly be considered, quote, foundation developers rather than volunteer developers. Uh, I would say in practice they are completely considered native foundation employees. Yeah, and I can testify that as being one myself, uh, a remote contractor. Yeah, all right. Next question, please. More questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, we've got one here. It's, it's, it's going to take another year before you have this opportunity. Doesn't have to be development related. Yeah. Ask me my favorite color. Yeah. What's your favorite color, Chad? My favorite color is blue. Chad's favorite color is blue. <laughs> Here's a question. I don't know if I can pose it properly. And if, uh, um, Sorry, we can't you. hear you. I, I don't. Here's a question. I don't know if I can pose it properly, and I don't know if it's the sort of question that you're interested in. I like Wikipedia a lot. I don't see myself devoting much time to Wikipedia itself. What I'd like to do is to write my own program and use all this fantastic data that Wikipedia's got, and perhaps the tools as well, to write something which in the end is likely to be completely different and may not be part of Wikipedia at all. Is that practical? Is it within copyright? Whatever. Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, so we have um, some pretty good uh, APIs to extract certain data right now. Um, the Paso team's new content API will uh, make it a lot easier to consume uh, content, whether that's structured content, like pulling it out of tables and templates, or unstructured content if you just want to show snippets of Wikipedia content. Um, and in terms of licensing, yes, so uh, Wikimedia content is freely licensed, which means that as long as you provide attribution, uh, for your downstream users, then it's perfectly legal. And is it easy? Well, that's probably in the, that's more for you to judge than us. Uh, we just provide the APIs, you tell us they're terrible. Um, but yes, the, 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 the idea is very much that we provide that open platform for other people to use um, however they want. Thanks a lot. And Wikidata is awesome. There, better. <laughs> I'll, I'll say, uh, in general, I mean, if, you, if you're not talking about the, um, the data in Wikipedia, but just about the software that's built, uh, MediaWiki's extension API is very awesome, and I have abused MediaWiki in many ways of, uh, over many different projects. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, um, it, there's lots of interesting ways to use the extension API to integrate data from other sources into something which looks like a wiki, and you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. One other source of data, you were, you were talking about building tools around the data. Um, we also have the labs and tool labs infrastructure as well. Um, and all of the production databases minus the, the private data, like user account information and so forth, is replicated to this test environment, uh, this labs environment, where you know individual users can write tools around this data um, and, and get re really dive into the data in ways that the API never really anticipated or exposes. Um, and it's really cool the kind of things that people can, can do with that data on their own. I've just been to the other talks in the main auditorium about it. Cool, very good. Okay, so we have five more minutes, time for a few more questions. And, and then I guess the, the one last place, so I guess the big three places you can get our data publicly is the API that James mentioned, um, labs, and then uh, Seabrand also mentioned uh, the XML dumps that are available at dumps.wikimedia.org. Um, and that's the, they're dumped every, I guess, couple of days, couple of weeks, depending on the size of the wiki. Month, month, okay, um, and, uh, and and all that data is also freely available for you to, to slice and dice however you choose, so. Um, I'll just 
just repeat that so people, I think we're talking about adding parsoid format dumps to that page as well in the nearish future. So no wiki text parsing required. We have five minutes left, time for two questions. Cool. Um, so again, a slightly different question, um, which is that looking back on your time as developers, if you had to go back and change one thing, <laughs> do one project differently, uh, not make one mistake, what would it be? Central auth. Yeah, that <laughs> Central auth. Um, so, so going back historically, this this is not really. I don't think this is the fault of anyone standing up here. Um, it's Brian Viver's fault. So if you find Brian Viver, blame him. Um, it, it, back when Wikipedia and and the sister sites were all founded, um, we never anticipated having as many users or as sites as we did. Um, so we never really came up with the idea of joining user accounts across multiple wikis. So we wrote this giant thing called Central Auth, which manages accounts across multiple wikis. And it's a disgusting piece of software. Everyone hates it. No one wants to work on it. Um, we all wish we had a time machine and could go back and just do it right to begin with, I think. Um, but there's probably a bunch of other things, too. Gabriel talk about Wiki For me personally. <laughs> For me personally, I just would have applied for a job at the foundation earlier. <laughs> Sam is without words. <laughs> Sam has to deal with deployment systems, so I imagine that. Um, Sam doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> that too. Uh, oh, I know where the bodies are buried. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it's a bit, a bit of a difficult one, but things change all the time. I have been responsible, I broke the site numerous times, I broke it in big ways, I broke it in small ways. Mistakes happen. It, would you go back and change it? Yes, but you wouldn't learn from it, so what's the point? Yeah, so parsing has been quite a big project now, and uh, I think if we, in 2004 we actually had some efforts to provide a proper parser. But back then it turned out to be really slow and we didn't really have any resources. We were all volunteers. There was no foundation. So, um, yeah, it was more important to keep the site up. I think it was the right decision at the, end, at the time. But um, if we had gone down a route with a real puzzler and better backend infrastructure, we could have saved us a lot of time and maybe we hadn't got, would have gotten to something like visual editing earlier. Last question? Two minutes. Parser yeah. functions. Parser Last functions. Parser functions. They're yeah. evil. Uh, PHP in general, but yeah. What advice would you give to a new developer interested in contributing? Run away. <laughs> no, no. Oh, we love you, and we're here to help. And uh, working on Wikimedia projects is one of the most valuable and fantastic ways to contribute to the open source community. And you can do it in pretty much any language you can name. We've got code in that language somewhere. Um, we don't have any COBOL, I don't think. Yeah, but we have Haskell. Yes. You know, <laughs> which is a sign. And we have OCaml. No, no, I, I uh, so, sorry, sorry, I have to uh, time out. Last question. Yes, uh, you mentioned that test database uh, where it's uh, uh, wiki data is uh, replicated real time. I just want to know what kind of uh, approval or vetting you need to uh, grant access to the two server. Do you need uh, proper vetting or approval or just an email Labs. developer and it's set up for you? Um, f so for getting servers for things, um, that goes through a, a no kind of more or less normal procurement process with operations. Um, we always have enough servers to get the stuff done that we need to get done, um, but we're very stingy on using our, like every single one of our servers is in use pretty much. We don't have like a huge stack of unused servers. Um, so we do have to order things, um, but Labs has made it a whole lot easier for us to do these sorts of things because we have that virtualization environment now. So if I need to spin up something new to, to start testing or experimenting, like it's really easy to do that with a virtual machine in Labs instead of having to procure hardware to do it. Um, as far as a volunteer getting access to Labs, I believe it's pretty much you sign up for an account on wikitech.wikimedia.org and then possibly go on the IRC channel and ask for a little bit of help. There's not really a big process about getting access to it. 
Yeah, that, that's the whole point of Wikimedia Labs. We prov provide you with a playground and resources so you don't have to buy them yourself. And you, as long as you do things that benefit uh, the Wikimedia uh, community, uh, then um, you're, you're welcome to use as many resources as that great thing that you want to do uh, requires. Benefit to the community is pretty loosely interpreted too, right? Um, we're not we're not grading your homework to see how many people really love the thing you make. It's about are you trying to help the mission, right? Are you trying to use the data to do something new, to do something awesome, to do something that couldn't be done before, or to do something that was done before but you don't like the way that it's done? Um, it I, labs is like the coolest thing that the foundation has because it's basically Amazon Web Services plus Heroku for free for anybody who comes and asks for an account. And um, on the IRC channels, we have an incredible community of volunteer labs users who help each other out, like whatever you're stubbing your toe on, either somebody's going to help you with it because they already know it or somebody's going to drop everything that they're doing because you just nerd sniped them and gave them a really great problem to fix. <laughs> okay, that, that ends the Ask the Developer sessions. Uh, thank you for, uh, for being here. Thank you for your questions. Um, we hope to see you again next year. Yeah. to Seabran for proposing the session. I just wanted to say, even though the Ask the Developers session is over, if you see one of us developers around and you want to ask us something, just say hi. <laughs> okay.